that was thought of, and the, the concept was thought of on the bus. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, I did all my shopping in Chinatown, as you can see, and uh, uh, from the bird, which uh, didn't look anything like that, it had fuzz on it or something, mm -hmm. and I put real feathers on it and transformed it into this beautiful creature, which mm -hmm. is now the China, the Latin name is the Chinatownus paradisiae, which is a uh, Chinatown bird paradise. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's clap activated. The clapper is in effect, uh, as you can see here. And among other things, it sings Beethoven, uh, the Ode to Joy. And that's a, uh, pretty much what attracted me to the whole thing. The hardest thing was finding those pagodas. I knew I wanted gold plastic pagodas. And then it took about three quarters of a year to find them. Really? But finally found a little store on a side street and mm -hmm. uh, they had pagoda nightlights. Mm -hmm. Which I <laughs> immediately bought and uh, that completed my cityscape by the time. <laughs>
through the mist. It's about composition, it's about texture, it's about line, it's about shape, it's about paint, and it's about atmosphere. And I uh, like it. It's one of my favorite paintings that I've done. I love it. I think it's wonderful. And I think that it's so amazing to see so many talented people at work here. trying to get into special effects. Uh, I did this piece. Uh, it's computer-based. Um, uh, PC. Mm -hmm. I use uh, Poser uh, as the animation program on the computer. I just, just started going crazy. Just be creative and do anything that I can. Being a guard pretty much every day, going through the same routine. Uh, I found it funny. Or yeah. funny so I decided to make yeah. fun of myself. This is my first time here at Employee Art Show. So. Uh -huh. Incredible. Cool. I'm in the Department of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, and I'm an assistant curator who focuses on African art here at the museum. 
This morning, I'm going to give you a quick overview of uh, our new special exhibition, Art and Oracle, Spirit Voices of Africa. And um, many of you may have already noticed that it's a little bit of an unusual and unconventional exhibition in a lot of ways. The discipline of art history trains us to focus on the development of individual artists, specific artistic movements, or periods generally, and this is an exhibition that is more conceptually structured um, and crosses those kinds of traditional boundaries. It takes a very different kind of comparative approach to how different peoples throughout time have conceived of their universe and the concept, their concept of the forces that shape it. And for example, in this exhibition, um, you'll come across things from uh, cultures as different and disparate as um, the Yoruba of Nigeria. And uh, the work on your left is a carved calabash, a gourd, um, that is um, in the Yoruba world considered to be a cosmogram, a, um, a conceptual diagram of the universe. The lid is associated with the realm of the spirits and the gods, and the bowl um, that fits into it is the world of the living. Um, very elegant wor work that um, expresses the unity and the interdependency of these. Um, on your right, a 12th century glazed bowl from Iran in the Metropolitan's collection um, that features the sun at the center of images of the zodiac reflecting upon um, the way that uh, the universe is organized in that part of the world. And um, one of the things that is really at the heart of this kind of approach um, is uh, the exploration of a theme that considers how throughout history, people have called upon their religious beliefs to help them to find solutions to their most confounding problems. They have invoked divine powers for insight, intervention, and direction in order to better control their fate. Over the centuries and across the globe, such appeals have raised perennial questions and addressed inquiries ranging from how to alleviate illness, protect against evil, prevail over an adversary, remedy a natural catastrophe, and obtain guidance in, in decision making. In response, the systems of thought and belief drawn upon by a society's visionaries have given creative artists inspirational subject matter. The term oracle itself derives from the Latin verb orare, which means to pray or to speak, and may be defined as a divine communication delivered in response to a petitioner's request. In ancient Greece, oracles were sacred sites where petitioners could consult specific deities that communicated through signs that were interpreted by priests and priestesses. In Africa, with its vast array of cultures, the legacy of efforts to control fate is evident in works that display a diverse range of artistic expressions. And um, two of the most extreme comparisons that one can make in terms of the African works on view in this exhibition is the very, very powerful and aggressive Nkisi Nkondi figure from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which greets you when you enter the exhibition. Um, this kind of work was really uh, the result of a dialogue between the ritual specialist who uh, used this work and a Congo sculptor, and um, it really um, was designed to act as a receptacle for a very powerful ancestral force that guided that specialist in investigating all kinds of uh, disruptions that may have affected the social harmony of a particular community. Now, the, uh, the image is that of a very 
uh, formidable leader. He's got his hands on his hips. Um, that in Congo culture is uh, a gesture of poise and of leadership. Um, and all of that metal hardware that you see protruding from the chin and from the torso is actually a record of every invocation that the ritual specialist who used this made to activate the force within on behalf of the community. And so really this kind of effect was not part of the original um, sculptor's design. It actually um, developed over the course of many decades of use. And um, it's very important to understand that kind of thing when experiencing this kind of presence. In Congo culture, it really would have inspired a great deal of confidence in this work's ability to act on its behalf instead of, uh, and, and, order, and also to uh, really intimidate um, anyone who might have ideas of um, disrupting uh, the harmony of a particular community, that there would be consequences that they would have to pay if they chose to do so. On the right, a series of very delicate miniature figurines from the Ivory Coast that were created by a Sanufo brass caster. Things are only about an inch to two inches tall. And they were commissioned by female diviners in the Ivory Coast to attract uh, nature spirits to their side during consultations that would provide guidance and insight into different um, cases that they were um, providing guidance in. Um, these kinds of works are designed to be aesthetically very refined and really are intended to dazzle the spirit world with their beauty uh, so that they will be induced to participate in those kinds of exchanges. So this exhibition is basically a, in a sense, a survey of um, over 50 different uh, artistic traditions in sub-Saharan Africa. And the works range in media. We um, have on view things ranging from metalwork to terracotta to um, textiles and beadwork and ivory. Um, it's incredibly diverse in terms of the kind of materials that artists have uh, transformed into mediums for communication with the spirit world. And um, we hope that in this kind of exhibition, there's really something for every aesthetic taste. Uh, in some instances um, that we explore in this exhibition, uh, F the combined efforts of a ritual specialist and an artist gave form to divination instruments used to tap into otherwise inaccessible knowledge. And um, I think an especially interesting juxtaposition is this of two Sanufo works, also from the Ivory Coast, like the miniature figurines we looked at. The equestrian on your right is actually the kind of small wood sculpture that diviners who originally worked with those uh, little brass figurines would aspire to commissioning and owning once they got their careers established and they were really um, able to afford this more expensive sculptural genre. And this kind of uh, ownership um, of this kind of work really inspire, uh, inspired a lot of confidence in uh, the diviners who owned these kinds of things. Uh, their clients um, perceived them to be uh, quite successful if they um, had the means to afford these. And also, um, the result would have been interpreted um, that the, the spirit world would have been flattered by the beauty of increasingly more complicated and expensive sculptures uh, presented uh, to attract them. Uh, on the left, a Cafigilejo figure, um, also created by a Sanufo artist, for Sanufo elders who probed into different matters that affected the well-being of the community. Its use is very secret and very hidden. Um, and uh, 
its form, it really is quite fascinating in terms of its playing with the, our conventional notions of what the boundaries of figural sculpture are. Um, although this is clearly figurative, um, uh, it's shrouded, a woodwork shrouded in textile. Uh, the boundaries are extended with feathers and porcupine quills, and all kinds of medicinal materials are appended to it. Um, it really uh, attempts to get at the heart of the immateriality of the spirit world and the fact that spirit forces really um, have no conventional um, form that they adhere to. Other works in this exhibition um, are devotional items that were prescribed to benefit diviners' clients and enhance their quality of life. On the left is a very uh, complex and elegant uh, mother and child, a maternity figure from the Democratic Republic of Congo that um, would have been the uh, kind of work that a Lulua woman would have commissioned on the advice of a diviner to enhance her ability to conceive children. This work is on loan to us from the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, it reflects the very complex body ornamentation that Lulua women, uh, arist aristocratic Lulua women, uh, wore in, on their bodies in the 19th century. Um, and it has this very polished, um, very elegant surface, whereas on the right is a work in our own collection from the Republic of Benin, um, very intimidating, aggressive, and scary looking, and intentionally designed to um, have that kind of impact on the viewer. Um, a full sculptor created this work, which is actually a Janus, it has two faces, to protect a particular full household from any evil uh, in will that might have been directed toward that particular household. Um, not only does it have this ability to um, uh, detect danger from either direction through these two visages, but it also has this encrusted surface that is a result of repeated libations performed by the family in order to fortify the um, participation of the spirit world in protecting their home. But it has this um, skull that crowns the head, um, a dog skull that would have been recommended by the ritual specialist involved um, uh, because of the symbolism of uh, dogs as protectors of the household who guard over uh, their masters. Um, the results uh, of the dialogues that happen between, oops, sorry, between uh, sculptors and ritual specialists in the creation of works that actually uh, perform as uh, crucial instruments in their own practices can range from utilitarian implements to the masterpieces presented in this exhibition, artifacts that reflect the highest level of execution and ingenuity. One of the premises of this exhibition is that the artistic merits of a work directly affected its ability to successfully bridge human and divine realms. And on the left, you have a very elegant figurative pair, uh, male and female couple from the Ivory Coast created by a ballet sculptor to act as the primary uh, tools of a ballet diviner um, in our own collection, usually on view in the African galleries here at the museum. On the right, a very elegant uh, Luba female bull bearer from the Democratic Republic of Congo in the collection of the American Museum of Natural History. This kind of work would have had a parallel kind of role to the ballet uh, works in our collection in a very different culture and relates to a, an entirely different system of ritual practice. Um, both of these works date to the 19th century. 
More than 20 million people of Yoruba heritage dispersed across the globe trace their origins to southwestern Nigeria. The Yoruba worldview and divination system has influenced those who live in urban centers ranging from Lagos, Nigeria, Bahia in Brazil, Havana in Cuba, and our own New York City. And uh, the works uh, that you see are here are both Yoruba. On the left, a very, very important work in the collection of the Ulmer Museum in Germany. Um, it's a Yoruba divination tray, um, and it is um, especially important because it's the first, the earliest w example of a wood sculpture to have been preserved in the West. It was collected along the coast of West Africa in 1650. Um, and then entered into the collection of a, a German uh, aristocrat. On the right is a very elegant um, and beautiful ivory tapper that um, is in the collection of the Musée de l'Homme in Paris. Um, the Yoruba god of wisdom, or Mila, is invoked by priests on behalf of individuals when seeking to clarify their destiny. During Ifa rites, communication with the spiritual realm is initiated when the diviner taps, strikes a tapper on the flat surface of a wooden divination tray, such as this example. The tray adorned with sacred images and dusted with powder serves as a template on which sacred signs related to the personal concerns of a diviner's client are traced as the point of departure for analysis. And um, in contrast to the transitory signs that are traced at the center of one of these trays, the more permanent backdrop of the carving around the perimeter, sorry, um, uh, constitutes an artistic commentary on the forces that shape human experience and the universal needs fulfilled by quest for enlightenment. Uh, two other Yoruba works that reflect the central role that divination plays in that culture and society. Um, on the left, a very wonderful carved um, ivory vessel uh, in our collection that houses um, the uh, precious uh, palm nuts that a, a Yoruba diviner uh, uh, uses as a vehicle of communication with the god of wisdom. Um, and actually, we have footage of these kinds of rituals that are um, screened for you at the end of the exhibition to actually give a little bit more context to these kinds of invocations. On the right, a very wonderful work um, by the master sculptor Oluwe of Ise, who uh, worked um, during the early 20th, late 19th century uh, for Yoruba kings uh, and created stupendous monumental architectural elements for their palaces. This is a door for one of those structures and um, at the center of the composition is a Yoruba Ifa tray that's surrounded by birds who are poised um, to fly off from the surface. They're carved in very wonderfully deep relief. Um, and those birds are symbolic of the metaphysical uh, life force that um, uh, it, uh, is a catalyst for uh, knowledge. Intimacy with the world of their ancestors or spirits confers power and status upon diviners regardless of their culture or techniques. The Basinjo masquerade on your left, performed along the Cameroon-Nigeria border, employs a bizarre amalgam of carefully selected organic matter that intimidates viewers, endows omniscience upon the wearer, and dramatically calls into play the arsenal of power at its command during public performances. And um, this kind of work uh, really is quite a, very, a powerful statement about 
the ability of the spirit world to transcend all kinds of realms of experience, the feathers um, that uh, crown the headdress in this particular work are a reference to the powers um, being able to occupy the, the air, um, the, there's all kinds of organic matter that refers to its connection with the earth, and there are shells attached to the, um, the textile um, robe that refer to the realm of, of the waters. Um, the headdress takes a crocodilian form, and it's really um, like that very fantastical looking Cafigilejo work that the Snufo create um, that I showed you previously. It's an attempt to really evoke and explore uh, and, uh, the, the form that these fantastical spirit forces um, may uh, take in our imagination. In contrast to this wonderful masquerade costume that we have on loan to us from Dresden in Germany, um, on your right is a very, very elegant, um, more, much more naturalistic representation of a Yombe mask uh, from the Democratic Republic of Congo that is in the Kimball Museum's collection. The power and influence wielded by Yombe diviners are suggested by the idealized representation of this diviner's mask, the heightened realism and the meditative expression of which inspired confidence in the wearer's powers of perception. Music often plays a central role in divination rituals. It serves to summon and act as a means of communication with spiritual realms. The design of this instrument on your left, um, what we refer to as an idiophone in our collection here at the Metropolitan, is also represented in a related architectural plaque on loan to us from the British Museum. Both from the Kingdom of Benin in Nigeria commemorate the triumph of a 16th century leader. On the eve of a battle, King Esidje defied the bird of prophecy, which is depicted on both the instrument um, presented as an instrument and the instrument wielded by these courtiers. Um, and this, this apparition warned that Isidje's army was de destined to be defeated by a formidable enemy. And thereafter, um, because he defied that warning and prevailed over that um, that uh, prediction, he sponsored its, the, the image's transformation into a musical instrument whose performance celebrates Benin's leaders' ability to determine their own fate. Um, in conclusion, while many of the works included in this exhibition survive as impressive visual documents, of the quest for insight by individuals now long forgotten, several are monuments commissioned by African leaders before colonialism, created in response to auguries concerning their destiny at the beginning of their reign. Unequaled in their expressive power, these two works eloquently convey the personal aspirations of their royal patrons. Uh, the gleaming copper alloy divination portrait of King Glele on your left, who reigned um, from 1858 to 1889 in the guise of the armed war god Gu, projects a sense of invulnerability and martial strength at the height of Dahomey's power. His son, whose divination portrait is on your right, Gebazen, who reigned from 1889 to 94, however, inherited the kingdom on the eve of its defeat at the hand of French imperials. His consuming preoccupation with keeping that enemy force at bay is reflected in a life-size representation of a surrealistic creature who fuses shark and human features uh, that he commissioned before his exile to Martinique. Um, 
both of the images are, once again, no attempt whatsoever to be a naturalistic portrait. The uh, king would have spoken to the artists who created these works about the content of uh, the verses of poetry that were associated with his individual divination sign and the predictions that were made about his reign. And these works were created to comment on those auguries and to, um, they were very much customized to uh, reinforce the power of those leaders and to um, help them counter any of the challenges that they would be confronted with over the course of their reign. Um, Gebazin had been warned that enemy forces from beyond the waters would pose formidable uh, opposition, and hence the design of a very powerful physiognomy that is fused with aquatic um, references. Uh, in summary, in the Western world, in our own experience, uh, artists of great skill capable of creating works of universal and enduring significance are themselves often described as visionaries. In Africa, a parallel vision is found in the partnership of a diviner and artist. The nexus of spiritual belief and artistic expression embodied in works featured in this exhibition reveals how African cultures, each in their own way, seek to transcend the limitations of human knowledge by reaching out for intervention, protection, and direction from the realm of the divine. Thank you for coming this morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the first group actually responded. Maybe I'll try it again. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you. You know, we've already had a rehearsal, so we ought to be fairly smooth uh, uh, for this uh, discussion this time around. I want to thank you all uh, for coming this morning, and it's uh, a pleasure for me to give this report. It's the kind of a report that I'm delighted to give because it's mostly good news. And I guess uh, many of you wouldn't consider uh, a budget deficit in the museum good news, but in fact it is because we started the year expecting a budget deficit of somewhere around uh, $2 million. And we worked hard all year and we had some ups, we had some downs, and in the end, we're projecting now that our deficit will be well below $1 million. So we've had a, a successful year. And I want to thank all of you for the uh, contributions that you've made to that. <coughs> Excuse me. Going um, uh, into this fiscal year, our goal was to uh, attain a specific level of savings, and we were able to do that. We achieved it. Our goal was also to increase revenue in areas like admissions, uh, membership, and fundraising, and we achieved those goals. Our investments have continued to perform well in spite of the ups and downs, the excitement of Wall Street in recent months. In fact, the uh, museum's return on its investments in its endowment for the calendar year ended in December was better than 23% increase. A, a fabulous job by the investment committee and the investment department in finance. Uh, and so far in this fiscal year, which will end in June, we're uh, somewhere between 12 and 13 percent return, and that's better than all of the benchmarks that we compare against and puts us well into the top quartile of the institutions with which we compare. Uh, so we're very pleased with the return on our investments. Now, for the upcoming year, we're working now on the budget for 2001. And we will have savings targets. We will be projecting 
a deficit going in that we will be trying to make up. There's still some uncertainties, but the year looks good. Our uh, admissions are strong, membership is strong. We're expecting uh, uh, good returns from our merchandising operations, so we're not expecting any drastic fiscal uh, type uh, measures that would uh, be unpopular, like uh, freezing the staff salary or something of that kind that does not look like that kind of year in 2001. And partly, uh, this is partly true because the news from the city government is uh, more positive than usual. Our somewhat newly benevolent mayor uh, <laughs> Ha has decided not to decrease the funding for the cultural institutions, so we will not be going through that uh, dance we were becoming accustomed to between city council and the mayor this year. Uh, we are hoping and expecting that the city council may in fact add some to the mayor's uh, uh, level funding from the previous year, so we're expecting some better news there. In addition, Philippe and I called on the mayor recently to make a special case for the Metropolitan and its operating budget. I don't know yet whether that argument will bear fruit when the budget is negotiated over the next two weeks, but we're cautiously optimistic. And at this point, I would like to single out a, a staff member who has had a great deal to do with our involvement with city council and government affairs in the city and the state, Liz Edmond. Many of you know Liz. Uh, she's been responsible for government affairs, working as a special assistant out of my office. Uh, she's led the staff lobby group, which was so successful. More than about 100 of uh, employees, uh, many of you, went to your city council members last year and made the case for the Met and uh, talked about the contributions that we make to the city and the results were very positive. And I'm singling out Liz at this point because what you may not know is that Liz will be leaving the museum next month. Uh, she has decided to uh, pursue ordination as a minister. Now I want to thank Liz for all the, th the, the good work that she's done here. As Liz goes on to her new vocation, we want to wish her the best. And all I can say is, is the Lord is going to get one hell of a, I, I mean one heck of a, <laughs> One heck of an assistant and, and a darn good lobbyist as well. So we'll miss Liz. Liz, Liz, are you here? Yeah. Are you back there, Liz? Liz, back, Liz is back in the corner. Thank you very much. I would also like to acknowledge another staff member who will be leaving us, who I know is not here this morning, and uh, that is uh, Ella Kegler. Uh, you may have seen a notice that Ella has submitted her resignation. She's uh, going on to a different career and changing her personal goals. Ella has been with us in charge of internal audit and special projects out of my office. She's been with the museum for uh, about 15 years, and we will miss her. Uh, Ella has made uh, strong contributions all across the museum and the areas of audit and control and in staff diversity. And uh, the good news is that Ella will be continuing to work with us in those areas over the, ne the next several months. And uh, so when you see her, tell her we'll miss her, but we will have her at least part time. We also have some new staff members that I wanted to mention this morning. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if Michael Belkin is here, but I wanted to recognize Bel uh, Michael as the new chief technology officer. Now, if the name Michael Belkin sounds familiar to you, it may be because Michael was with us in uh, uh, 1996. He was in the systems group for a short time when the Metropolitan on the west side uh, lured him over to head their systems group. And for the last several years, he's uh, been very successful in leading the opera in their systems area, and we were fortunate uh, to attract Michael back to the museum to be our chief technology officer. Michael started to work on April 24th, and we're delighted to, uh, to have him. And the systems group has made some real progress over the last year. Uh, they have uh, brought uh, email and access to the internet on the Met Museum network and we've rolled out optical fiber thanks to the buildings department and working with the telecommunications group and systems. 
uh, to get most of the departments wired, and we are well on the way to complete that work. Uh, and we, we have net access in uh, each of the departments, even those not on the, uh, not on the network. And we've established a computer liaison group, wherein each department has a representative that is, uh, gets new information, is kept up to date on what's happening in the area of systems, and is trained so that each department will have a specialist who can provide assistance and guidance for those of us who've become uh, so accustomed to working on workstations and PCs, but who may not always know all the answers. And, know whether or not to open the latest Valentine or I love you message that might come along. So the systems group has done a good job and we really appreciate, uh, appreciate what they've done. Also in the technology area, most of you know that we established our new website in January. It's receiving awards as uh, one of the best new websites that's up there. We have uh, between 3,500 and 4,000 of the items in the collection uh, up on the web. It's beautiful. The merchandise is selling extremely well on the web, uh, on our website. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend you go to the Hazen Center or your own PC or somewhere, some uh, other uh, workstation and take a look at metmuseum.org. I think you'll like it. Merchandising has new, uh, two new staff members as well, Sally Pearson, joined us as vice president in charge of merchandising overall. We're delighted to have Sally. She has an extensive uh, background uh, with Liz Claiborne and with Sachs and others in the retailing area, and she's already making a difference having been here about a month at this point. We also have new in the merchandising area, John Rice, who is responsible for merchandising, finance, and operations. And John will be in charge of Middle Village and the, uh, the operations side of the merchandise operation. And I think the new team with uh, those who've been in merchandising for some time are, will make a difference. And we're looking forward to, to new heights in the area of, of merchandising. Uh, we'll, I'm also announcing, and perhaps you've seen it, that the well-known uh, Danny Berger, who's been in charge of our mezzanine merchandising operation, will be reti as retiring from the museum. Uh, he'll be spending more, even more time in Italy, and I'm glad for all of us who are friends of Danny to report that he will be with us from time to time doing some special projects for the museum, so he will not be here quite as much, but we will see him from time to time. The security part department I wanted to mention as well this morning, they put a lot of effort into developing improved emergency response procedures in two different areas. We've designated staff members from each department who are trained in procedures for evacuating personnel in the event of em emergencies. St the security group is, has an excellent education program and they're doing a good job of spreading that information around and it should be helpful. But in addition to taking care of the people in the museum, we have the art to be concerned about, and there's a program that they've worked out with the curatorial forum uh, to uh, assign people in each of the curatorial departments who will be responsible in case of emergency to coordinate with security for taking the appropriate action to protect the art, whether it's leaks or storms or floods or whatever comes up, and that should make us even better prepared in the event of some uh, unnatural disaster. Uh, in the buildings and construction area, we're completing phase two of what we've been calling the Greek and Roman master plan. And we'll be moving this summer to new offices, many in this room, to the third, fourth, and fifth floor over the Great Hall. I know some of you have been inconvenienced by the unforeseen delays in these moves coming up, but I want to thank you for your patience, and I hope when you get to your new offices and your new workplaces there, you will agree that the wait has been worthwhile. I also want to thank all of you who have participated in the uh, staff uh, and interdepartmental uh, services surveys that we took last fall. Uh, we've reported to you in the bi-weekly uh, many of the actions that have taken place. I've met with all the department heads who are involved in these service departments, and all of them have plans to be responsive to those suggestions and 
mostly uh, positive, critical criticisms that came along, and we're working hard to get some of those fixed. Perhaps you've already seen some changes around the museum. You will, in fact, if you've come in over the last couple of days through the 84th Street entrance or left in that way, you'll see some of the beautification that's going on there. I recommend it to you. It is, uh, is an example of what you'll be seeing further in the staff cafeteria and in other areas as we go through the summer. And we're all working hard to make this a more pleasant and supportive place in which to work. Now it comes time for me to relinquish the microphone to the director. Uh, at the first session, I, I mentioned that perhaps my remarks might be somewhat more interesting than Philippe since he's having to resort to slides. But then I, I sat through his presentation and I must say it was really quite good. Um, <laughs> But you should stay awake because I want to warn you, there's a quiz at the end. Thank you. Uh, Dave is entirely right, of course. Um, I will speak about a whole category of objects that have no practical usefulness. Uh, they yield nothing to goods and services. Uh, they are major assets that yield no dividends, yet they require great care, they cost a fortune, <coughs> no practical use whatsoever, they're chattels, albeit of a higher order, uh, still, they're what we're about, and those are these inanimate uh, works of art. The first I show you, uh, before running through at great speed, the uh, exhibition program, which is quite crowded over the next few months, are a couple of recent acquisitions. You've heard and read about uh, the gift from Sara Lee Corporation of Monet's portrait of his son Claude, done in 1872, very high moment at the start of Impressionism, there it is, and uh, heard about uh, the purchase at auction <coughs> recently of the great masterpiece of Ludo Ludovico Carracci of the Deposition of Christ that you see in the state uh, in which it was at the auction on the left and uh, after the ministrations of Hubert von Sonnenberg. Uh, this work will be going on view this summer in a focus exhibition, a dossier uh, devoted to the Carracci at the Metropolitan, both drawings and uh, paintings. <coughs> this is a critical work um, at a moment of great hinge of the birth of uh, uh, the Baroque in the 1580s uh, when uh, the three Carracci's, brother and, and cousins, uh, literally found an academy in Bologna and changed the whole course of uh, painting, injecting uh, the study of uh, nature after a long, uh, rather sterile uh, period of uh, a form of academism that uh, is uh, mannerism. Uh, so this work is actually already on view in the gallery. I don't know whether it is now because it's probably being prepared for the uh, focus exhibition. Uh, the summer we'll see uh, a show devoted to uh, one of the great painters in terms of pure painting, uh, the joy uh, and the sen sensibility of painting on canvas and it is of course uh, Chardin, uh, French 18th century. Uh, specializing in still lives, including the one uh, fabulous flower picture from the National Gallery uh, Edinburgh in Scotland, and a number of uh, delightful scenes of domesticity, such as the picture lent from a private collection on the left. This show will have about 65 pictures and opens in the course of the summer. We're also focusing this summer on our permanent collection, and uh, in conjunction with the publication of uh, the collection of the works of John Singer Sargent in the Metropolitan, more than 300 uh, paintings, I mean the, the catalog that we publish is about the drawings and the watercolors, we'll be putting on view uh, about a hundred of uh, these works, drawings and watercolors, uh, upstairs. Uh, this also happens to be the 50th anniversary of the gift of these works by the uh, Sargent's sister to the uh, collection. And then, as you know, we've just reopened the Berith Blanco Patio, uh, the great treasure of uh, 
uh, Renaissance uh, art and decorative carving of the early part of the 16th century in southern Spain, but essentially uh, executed by Veneto Lombardian uh, artists. And what is essentially new, aside from the fact that uh, the uh, carvings and reliefs have been uh, cleaned and look quite splendid, is the floor, uh, which is no longer uh, red terrazzo, uh, but white marble, marble quarried in Belith Blanco itself, and from the same quarry that yielded uh, the marble floor of the original patio. So uh, we're much closer to the original now. Uh, it has been opened also with a temporary exhibition of a group of reliefs that once were part of uh, the castle and were only uh, rediscovered and re-identified in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris in recent years, and they're now upstairs on the balcony. And the other major reinstallation has not yet taken place, is about to, and it will open in the fall, and that is uh, the complete refection of our galleries devoted uh, principally to Byzantine art, uh, also to Visigothic uh, art and so forth, Celtic, and uh, twice the amount of space will be devoted to these major collections that heretofore had been granted on the south side of the grand staircase uh, since the Greek and Roman department is moving its treasury from the north side to its future new galleries over uh, the restaurant and the mezzanine offices and so forth. And um, in conjunction with this complete reinstallation, uh, we have also excavated an area under uh, the main stairs, uh, which we now refer to as the crypt. It pretty much looks like one, and that is where we will install light-sensitive material mostly, uh, Byzantine art from Egypt, formerly called Coptic, some of our great textiles that have been removed uh, from Gallery 1 in Egypt, which you saw uh, there waiting for uh, some of the Fayum portraits to be reinstalled. And the area under the stairs um, dating back to the early part of the century with its wonderful um, brick arches and uh, there you see the stairs themselves with unrebetted stone above you uh, will also provide a very good passageway in the middle of the galleries linking them uh, giving some more coherence and cohesiveness to this major installation of Byzantine art. Uh, among the other uh, smallish focused uh, exhibitions uh, that we will mount over the next few months uh, is, um, for example, the work of uh, Baskenis, which is mostly unknown to uh, American visitors, there being so few uh, in this country, a uh, painter from Bergamo uh, who delighted in still lives mostly of musical instruments. Uh, an exhibition uh, done by the photography department uh, of one of the great narcissistic uh, individuals of all time, La Castiglione, who was the uh, great beauty of her day, her day being the Second Empire in France. She was the mistress, among a number of other notables, uh, of Napoleon III. And she spent her life, in a sense, documenting herself through a whole group of photographs uh, and, um, in fact, there was a film in the 50s in which Yvonne de Carlo represented uh, her, but you weren't born yet. Um, and so this, this combines photographs from the photography department as well as uh, the uh, collections in France. Um, we have owned for a number of years uh, the portrait on the right, uh, which is the 18-year-old Queen Victoria by Thomas Sully, and we have the privilege of having the full-length portrait for which this is a study, and this is a wonderful opportunity to show some 30 to 35 works by Sully in uh, the collection. Uh, you'll recall that Karen Cohen, a great benefactress uh, of the drawings and, and print department, gave uh, a couple of dozen watercolors by uh, Eugène Delacroix, the great French uh, romantic artist some years ago, and in the fall, we will be doing an exhibition of uh, other works from her collection, which includes yet more works by Delacroix, other uh, great artists of the 19th century, uh, not only drawings and watercolors, but a number of oil paintings and oil sketches, such as the constable on the right, representing, of course, uh, clouds. And having uh, seen the majuscule in uh, Egyptian art in the fall, with the age of the pyramids and with uh, 
uh, the Roman period exhibition of ancient faces. We now go to the minuscule in Egyptian art, uh, showing a remarkable, a remarkable collection formed in the 19th century by a Colonel uh, Major Myers, uh, who ultimately bequeathed his collection of small precious objects to Eton College, uh, and the exhibition will be shown right out here in the Egyptian Special Egyptian Galleries a wonderful view of an individual private collection in uh, Europe in the 19th century. And uh, also representing uh, yet another area of interest in the museum, we go across back into the Atlantic to um, uh, pre-Columbian era with an exhibition of uh, silver uh, from uh, Peru, essentially from the second century BC to the time of the conquest that includes number of pieces found in a child's tomb nor in, in high in the Andes, and this exhibition also will be in the fall. And the last of the special focused exhibition I show you uh, this morning will also take place this fall. I think we have more than 20 exhibitions coming up. Um, uh, sheer folly, uh, but it's a wonderful indulgence. Uh, and that is, of course, the uh, Elliott collection of Chinese calligraphy, which we share. Uh, through purchases, gifts, and bequests with uh, Princeton uh, University Art Museum, and which will be on view here. Uh, so much for chamber music. Uh, the grand symphonic uh, nature of the exhibitions this fall is led by the largest one of them all, which is uh, Art of the Empire City, New York, from 1825 to 1861. In other words, essentially from the time of the Erie Canal, uh, which uh, to the start of the Civil War and the Era Canal, of course, uh, the opening of which um, uh, uh, with uh, opening the trade roads and the waterways to the city uh, transformed it into a great empire but also emporium city, the richest uh, city in this country and one of the, uh, already one of the richest cities in the world and of course the efflorescence of art uh, during those years. Uh, represented uh, by such works as uh, the large Fletcher presentation piece to um, Governor DeWitt Clinton, who is, of course, the one who opened the Erie Canal. Um, I guess uh, City Hall giveth, but it also lendeth, uh, because that portrait uh, by Samuel Morse of the Marquis de Lafayette uh, comes from City Hall, and it includes any number of works showing uh, really the uh, resurgence of American painting and sculpture, the William Sidney Mount uh, uh, it painted in Setauket, which is uh, the site, as you know, of Stony Brook today, uh, the uh, uh, Greek slave uh, Hiram Powers, uh, the fascination of Americans in the 19th century uh, with the uh, daguerreotype, uh, apparently more produced in this country uh, even than uh, in France, which uh, saw the invention of the daguerreotype. Here's a portrait of the uh, poet Walt Whitman. Uh, plenty of decorative arts, fabulous furniture, such as that from the Herter brothers. Uh, and so that is uh, the major show in terms of size and also uh, accompanying catalog in the fall. Uh, the other two are of a completely different nature. Uh, one is a show devoted to uh, gold uh, artifacts of the 6th to 3rd century BC from uh, the steppes of Central Asia, uh, from the eastern steppes of Russia and the foothills of the Ural Mountains. Uh, works created both by the Scythians and the Sarmatians, uh, both of which were described as among the nomadic tribes uh, by Herodotus in that part of the world, and uh, focusing essentially on a great new find made about 12 years ago in uh, Ufa, um, east, south, way east of and southeast of uh, Moscow in Central Asia, which included a whole group of uh, uh, stags more than two and a half feet high um, in wood and uh, covered in gold leaf. Astonishing objects that you see here. This is photographed actually in the Hermitage during conservation and mounting. Uh, the exhibition includes 
uh, a number of very precious works that were found along with the indigenous ones, these of certainly of Iranian uh, origin, uh, also found at Ufa, and recreating, in a sense, the great Scythian show that we had done in 1974, uh, borrowing a number of the fabulous works from the Gold Room at the Hermitage, the stag with which you're quite familiar on the left, and the great battle of the Greeks and Scythians on this sensational comb of solid gold on the right. And uh, as Dave said, there is a quiz, and uh, the quiz is, um, well, I, I, is that the question is, I'm going to show you a whole group of works of art <coughs> that will be shown in an exhibition, and uh, the idea is that you're to try to figure out uh, what they all have in common such as uh, the fresco on the left from Bosco Tricasi, uh, the Augustan uh, period uh, bronze sculpture of a boy on the right, uh, the portrait of Caesarion, uh, Ptolemy the Twelfth, the son of Antony and Cleopatra, which normally is shown uh, in the vicinity of the Temple of Dendur, uh, the Gandharan sculpture on the right, the Kushan period, uh, made in and carved in Afghanistan, uh, all, all in the same show, the Han period dancer on the left from Mesopotamia, the vessel that you see here, uh, the Celtic sword on the left, uh, the Gallo-Roman um, fibula on the right, uh, in the exhibition is the great Parthian uh, uh, silver right on, uh, even from Mesoamerica, this great Colima mask, Colombian, of course, if it's Mesoamerica, from the Iron Age, the great Indonesian uh, vessel uh, on the right, and from the Yoyoi period in early Japan, this great bell. So all of these works, plus about 100 others, will be shown together in one gallery <coughs> based on uh, what they all have in common, which is, of course, uh, that they were all created at the same time across the globe uh, in what is our millennial exhibition. They were all created around the year one, give or take 50 years before, 50 years afterwards. And it was a marvelous opportunity in an institution such as this one uh, that collects across the globe and across uh, time to be able to regroup these works uh, with that uh, commonality. And uh, the last two slides are those, and they represent uh, suits uh, by Coco Chanel. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much for your attention.